All right, welcome to the June 27th, 2023 Aries Cloud Agent Python user group meeting. Um, big agenda, lots of things to go over. Um, so we'll be talking about a pile of things, including um, probably the main topic, getting an on-creds Rust into Akapai. Um, the meeting is being recorded. So um, we will be posting it after this. Um, the meantime, a uh, reminder that this is a Linux Foundation Hyperledger meeting. Um, Linux Foundation meetings have an antitrust policy in place. As well, the code of conduct for Hyperledger is also in effect. Please be good to one another. Um, anyone want to um, introduce themselves that's new to the meeting and wants to talk about what they're doing, wants to make an announcement, or would like to add something uh, to the agenda, please raise your hand or just begin speaking and we'll go in turn. All right, nothing to announce, nothing to, it is summer season getting started, so there's not gonna be as many things going on. All right, um, reminder about the documentation. I have an idea for some more documentation to talk about, hopefully, if we have time, we'll see. All right, um, on the agenda, Akpai release 8.2 RC1 has been completed. Um, it was just released a few minutes ago, so it's out and available. Um, it's just a minor update. There is one more PR. Uh, that we're we're considering um, merging um, prior to the final 082. Um, I'll wait a little bit longer, but um, that may not make it. So we'll see how that goes. If not, if we decide not to include that one as soon as um, we've had some smoke tests done on this uh, 082 RC1, um, we'll complete um, 082 and release it. Um, is there any other PRs that anyone desperately wants into 082? If there's anything um, to highlight, please let me know or and let us know now. Um, happy to have that. Oh, we have another AI assistant in the crowd. I wondered about that. Oh, well, um, I guess we'll leave it. Um, okay, um, embedding an on creds Rust in Akapai, I wanted to give an update. We had a meeting yesterday on, on where we are with um, uh, BC Gov and DCO to talk about the code with us. So I was gonna talk about that. Um, Daniel, I had a presentation that I thought I'd go through to sort of summarize our meeting and, and please jump in if there's anything you see that's um, incorrect. Uh, or needs adjustment, but in the meantime, I'll go I'll go through with that. So um, we've had a goal for a little while now that we have an onCreds RS, so the Hyperledger and onCreds implementation um, in Akapai. Um, this talks about where we are and where we need to be. Um, so uh, we posted a code with us, and DCO has it. Um, a PR. Uh, it was awarded to Indicio, and that team's been working very hard on that, done a, a lot of work. Um, the PR submitted for merging, and we've decided to merge it into a developer branch. It's not quite ready for merging into main. Um, this will be, um, I, I think, likely is a extremely likely to be a breaking change. And um, so um, we're talking about now exactly what that means and, and how, how much of a breaking change it will be. The maintainers recommended to make it a breaking change that, that we were probably holding on to too many things to try to make Akapai backwards compatible in, in certain areas. And so it was time for a pretty significant change. Or if this is likely a, a place where a significant change would actually be helpful to everyone uh, versus a hindrance. Obviously, we want to keep things as backward compatible as possible, but just there comes a time where it's it it, it is a bigger problem to to try to maintain that versus moving forward with a breaking change. So, um, 
here are the things that we're proposing um, that be breaking and non-breaking as we go forward. So we want to minimize the changes to the issue credential and present proof protocol. So basically the interface between an issuing agent and a holder or between a holder and an issuing agent, between a holder and a, and a verifier, we want to minimize those changes. So we want the protocols um, to be to remain the same. Um, so basically hold your nose and keep the name of indie attachments. So even though it's indie attachments um, versus a non-creds, we would we would retain that and, and basically cover over any difference in the use of legacy indie adapters, identifiers, and all other ident identifiers. So basically when using legacy indie and where um, issuing credentials or or present proof, those would remain the same and so that if we interacted with a older version of Akapai, um, there would be no difference. And so that is the, that is a big um, um, interface that we want to keep the same. So that would remain. Um, we think we, it would be best to drop the legacy and on creds admin APIs and, and um, add, and I get, oh, yeah, legacy and on creds admin APIs and add new, whoops, uh, sorry, um, and, and add new and on creds APIs. So basically that means drop the scheme of the cred def and most of, and perhaps all of the revocation endpoints. So those would go away and we would add a new and on creds API. So basically, instead of there being a slash schema slash um, create or a slash schema, a get slash schema or a get slash cred def, the, these would be um, an on cred slash schema and on cred slash cred def. So that would be the idea there. So that would require the recoding of, of some uh, of controllers, basically. Um, to upgrade to the new release. So that's a big change. Adds an on, an on creds API, so adds those endpoints. Revocation, I wanna talk about a little bit separately. Um, so we'll get to that in a bit. Um, the next would be enable upgrading an existing Akapai implementation storage to the new breaking change version. So the idea would be that when a imp implementation of Akapai with a controller is updated together, um, that there would be a way to upgrade the storage so that the um, uh, the instance could function with the new release. However, <clears throat> in doing that, there would be no special support for, unlikely to be special support for a multi-tenant Akapai implementation. So basically, you would not be able to do something like pick and choose which tenants get updated to the new storage. All controllers would be updated together for the, to the new version. Um, storage for all wallets are updated. Uh, that means storage for all the wallets are updated during the deployment of a new version, which means all controllers would have to be updated when a multi-tenant updated. So the ramification of that is if you had a multi-tenant instance that had different controllers um, for the different wallets, all of the controllers would have to be updated together, um, not individual ones. If if your track if your instance all use the same software, <clears throat> the controller was the same, that that's easy and and you know no different from from a single a single tenant version but if you're if you actually had separate controllers for different tenants all of them would have to all of the controllers would have to be updated together does that make sense does anyone have any questions on that i don't know how many people in uh the community would have that issue but be aware of that um, we do want to retain the endorser implementation 
<clears throat> as much as possible hide endorsers from the controller in that in that the controller doesn't have to do anything that endorsing would take place within Akapai and the endorser would just basically be configured for an agent to say, I'm going to use an endorser. Here's the endorser I'm going to use and stuff would just happen and the controller would not be concerned with it. So that should happen within Akapai. Um, revocation. Um, I wanted to get into a bit of the history of revocation for those not aware of it, and then the plan for going forward. Um, historically, the first the first implementation of of revocation required the controller to do all of the work. So whenever revocation was needed, um, support was added in the cred dap. Then every time a new revocation registry was needed, it the controller would have to say, "Hey, go create a revocation registry." When, when we wanted to publish um, revocation registry entries, the status updates, um, that publishing had to happen. The controller had to manage that. Hardest yet, even of those things, was tracking when a new revocation registry was needed. And, and, so, and that was the big one that sort of triggered to us, oh my, uh, this, this was not going to work. This is too painful for the controller to be able to do that. So um, we, we moved away from that. In addition, <clears throat> when endorser functionality came in, that also all had to be done. Uh, essentially, um, the controller was doing it. And again, that was difficult to manage for the controller. So what we want to do is where we are today is we want to continue that, which is when we did the second implementation of revocation, Akapai does the work and the controller only does the things that trigger Akapai to do things. So the, the impacts of revocation should be, I'm going to support revocation during the credential issuance setup. So every time I, I create a cred def for a new credential type, I'm going to say whether I'm going to support revocation or not. If I am supporting revocation, I'm going to say how big my um, revocation registries are going to be. And that's it. Um, the controller needs to track the revocation ID for credentials when issued. So the identifier that is necessary for when a credential is to be revoked. Um, when necessary, obviously, the controller needs to revoke credentials, and they would use that rev revocation ID um, to do so. When they do that, Akapai is tracking the state of, of the revoked credentials, the fact that they've been revoked. And finally, the Akapai instance, the controller, um, needs to publish, um, trigger when publishes publications of revocations are done. And again, this is on a per credential type. So it's supposed to say, ah, I want to, on a, on a credential type, I want to revoke, I want to publish the revocations. And that could result in needing to publish um, multiple, you may have multiple um revocation registries that that have been active at various times and they have a backlog of revocations to publish that means that could be multiple transactions to be written um, all of that all of that detail beyond these four trigger points is all managed within Akapai and we want to keep that so the controller's life is simplified to supporting what's necessary for revocation. Um, right now, when we implemented that second implementation, we kept the admin API for both modes. So we kept all of the revocation endpoints so that the controller could manage everything itself. Probably that, that wasn't the best idea. Um, the plan now is to only keep the Akapai does all the work mode. It's much easier for everyone, for, for Akapai and for the controller to just say, um, Akapai manages the revocation work and the only input the controller has are these types of, uh, are, are these actions that can be taken. Um, I would point out that these activities are the same whether you're using a non-creds or whether you're using so something like status list 2021 and some other revocation mechanism. So 
this actually could work um, for any credential format, which is kind of why I was um, suggesting that the revocation endpoint may actually still exist. Um, and because it, it is generally useful, basically the only two things you do um, in the revocation endpoint is you revoke credentials um, given an ID, revoke credentials, and from time to time, publish revocation updates, publish them out to some other place. So um, that really could be done regardless of what revocation scheme or even what credential format you're using. So I don't know if we're going to get to that generic, but that that is something to consider and, and think about as we go forward with this. And then um, there's an, a bunch of cleanup to be done on the PR 2276, which is what was merged yesterday into a developer branch. Um, there's some issues that was, were raised um, into the Anoncred's Rust implementation for a couple of things. Um, no effort has been made to eliminate any no longer needed admin APIs and endpoints. So uh, I think it would be wise to do that. So at least the elimination of the endpoints and then look at what code needs to get eliminated as part of that. Um, we do need migration plan for issuers, holders, and verifiers, which is the migration storage scripts. <clears throat> Depending on um, you know, what the new storage looks like, what what needs to change, what additional data needs to be tracked or, or generated um, when doing an update. And then finally, um, the DCO team has got a pretty significant all-in-one test that is being used, but that is sort of a standalone test for all of the work. So that um, test needs to be um, added to the core integration tests so that at least that one specific test and probably other tests need to be added. I think those are the major elements. Uh, oh, no, there's a couple more. Um, oh, <laughs> big one. <laughs> that is the big one. Um, oops, come on. Um, Akapai does it all revocation. So we want to get rid of the uh, endpoints that allows a controller to manage the revocation all on its own, get rid of that, um, simplify, ideally, the endorser support, some sort of plugin that sort of says, oh, um, I'm going to call endorser, I'm going to call the endorser on pretty much every um, publication transaction, and if I have an endorser, it'll be used, and if I don't, it'll be a null, a null off of some kind. So, um, put that in. And then the other thing is, in addition to legacy indie support, um, support for did indie and did web implementations. Um, did indie would be uh, used for um, instances of indie that are able to support did indie <clears throat> using the indie VDR capability and, and um, implementations that support that. And then did web should be a pretty trivial implementation, which is basically a a transformation, um, basically being able to do posts, um, HTTP posts to URLs um, based on what the did web um, identifier is uh, that, that basically results in files being loaded to a web server. So um, there will be an implementation of some sort of registrar for, for did web, um, obviously that would need authentication to be able to post a file, you know, to a to a web server, and then the resolver that simply converts a did web, um, did uh, a did URL into a um, an HTTP URL. So that's the cleanup, <clears throat> and I think that's all. Nope, looks like ah yes. Um, Aries RFC changes, um, the indie attachment, I mentioned that earlier. Um, <clears throat> we will retain the indie attachment um, to be at least the indie, indie changes to an on-creds. So this needs to be added to the Aries RFC. Um, 
so that we sort of deprecate the indie attachment and add the anon creds. Um, agents that don't support a non-creds format on receiving an attachment in the non-creds format would send a problem report saying, hey, I can't handle this. Um, likely, it would be fairly easy to say, oh, I got this a non-creds attachment, but that's the same as the ND one, so I can use that and vice versa. Um, the interesting thing is that the non credits format could also be the W3C format attachment. And so um, if we were to complete the formalization of the non credits data integrity proof, um, we could actually use the existing W3C format that is used for JSON LD um, uh, credentials and use that in um, uh, use that for a non credit. So that's another possibility that is kind of interesting. And I think that's all I had. I didn't see hands raised or questions. So there we go. Tim. <clears throat> I can't hear you, Tim. Go ahead. Uh oh. Fix my health. Is that better? There we go. Yeah. Oh, now um, really excited about the revocation changes. Um, our own experience in trying to work with issuers, we gave up trying to explain to them how to manage revo um, the revocation registry. So we'd actually pretty much concluded we needed to write something ourselves to manage it. So this is that's really good. Just one real um, quick note: you had renovation in the title, not revocation. <laughs> <laughs> I will fix that. Thank you. Know, you. It, but anyway, really good. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So we've. So you were actually trying to use the controller doing the revocation, like all the pieces? Yeah, we tried basically in one of our pilots, we had a, the, the issuer and we, you know, for the early tests, we were managing it ourselves. Then we tried to get them to write it in the controller and they just pushed back so heavily. Yeah, yeah. This really it's, is not our business. Why are we doing this? And I agreed. So we kind of, we dropped it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> we do have this fully implemented and we use it all the time. Um, so, you know, this idea that Akapai handles it all is, shouldn't, you know, is, is implemented and, and should make it a lot easier. Um, we even have a feature, we ran into a situation, uh, those may not be aware, we ran into a situation where, um, a, a wallet got out of sync with the ledger as far as what was revoked and what wasn't. And we were even able to put in a, a correction that allowed us to resynchronize. Um, so basically, if if the if a rev, uh, a publication of a revocation registry failed, um, we would actually detect that and correct uh, the revocation. So that we took a little bit of work, took a little bit of understanding, um, but we got it um, so that we were able to do that. So that would, it, I believe that would um, continue to be a feature in the goal of this. Any other questions or comments? And Daniel, how did I do? Uh, I, I think that was a really good summary. Um, kind of, I, I don't know if now is a great time to talk about it, but just because it was fresh on my mind, yeah. Um, that last point that you raised, um, talking about the anon creds in W3C format and using the LD proof VC detail attached yeah. format. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually happened to do an evaluation recently on, on what it would look like for anon creds to be in W3C format and be exchanged over the existing issue credential and present proof uh, yeah. protocols. And the LD proof VC detail attachment format is pretty specific to linked data proofs. So I, my conclusion as I was going through that was actually that we would probably need a different attachment format in order to communicate about the requirements of the anon cred specific credential and all the things that factor into that. So I, I'd be interested in how you came to that conclusion because our conclusion is the opposite. <laughs> that's funny. Okay. I, I have a document I can probably That'd be share great. with you and 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 you did look over Andrew's work that he did in that? Yes. 
yeah. So it, it, it wasn't so much um, that there was any issue with the actual format of the credential itself or, or the presentation itself, but rather how we expressed as an issuer what was to be issued uh, using the LD proof BC detail attachment format. It, it was just, it was a little bit of a, a, a contortion, I suppose, to okay. get the I'm LD proof. Very interested in that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, aside from that, I uh, also wanted to mention that I have created a project board for uh, some of those remaining items that were discussed in Stephen's presentation. Uh, I've been going through and populating that board with a bunch of stuff um, uh, and we'll continue to do that and add some more detail to those tasks. So um, that's out there and I linked to it from the agenda. Oh, good. Okay. And I'll add my presentation renovation and all um, to the agenda as well. I keep forgetting to do that when I do these presentations, so. Okay, any other comments from anyone? Um, if anyone is interested in, uh, uh, this is a chunk of work that needs to get done. Um, we could definitely use others um, joining in and, and helping out with this. The reason we put it into a uh, a, a developer branch, um, a, a branch off main was to uh, enable multiple developers to be able to work on it, um, do merge requests, uh, pull requests into that um, into that new uh, uh, branch in preparation for it going into main. We do. I'm a huge fan of not having developer branches and, and doing development on the main branch. So um, I do not like to see that um, active um, separate branch. So we could really use some help at um, getting that completed and, and getting that work done. So um, if anyone has um, uh, is willing to help out on that, uh, we would very much appreciate it. Okay, whoa, uh, where did I go? That was unexpected. Oh, that's why I keep forgetting when I leave it in that mode. Okay, um, let me get back to the agenda. Um, Probably talk a bit about this tomorrow on the Aries working group call. I'm not sure. Um, updating Aries mediator service, given the op open sourcing of Indicio socket doc. Um, my plan was to put in um, some some issues into Aries media uh, mediator service um, to talk about how Indicio's socket doc, which they announced last week and open source last week could be used. Um, I think it's a huge um, um, improvement in how that's gonna, uh, how uh, an ARIES uh, mediator can be implemented. So um, like to see that done. Um, I'm assuming that, you know, uh, in the in DCO socket doc picture, they just put mediator cluster. Um, that could still be an Akapai cluster. And so um, the goal would be to put that in place. I think we've recently done um, work to enable, um, uh, you know, the use of Redis and um, cache consistency using Redis in Akapai such that we can have uh, horizontally scalable instances in cases where there is no um, web sockets involved by taking web sockets out of the picture, putting them into socket doc, that means that we can have a, a scalable Aries uh, um, Akapai uh, mediator client. Once we add the um, connection with the HTTP based um, um, socket doc. So that you know, is is going to be a key goal. So those interested in working on that, um, please, you know, raise your hands. As I say, I think we need to get a uh, lines and boxes picture of what uh, it's going to look like. But I think with socket doc in place, it's much, much easier to have Aries mediator service implemented. Um, one other thing we want to do, and I realize that there's a little bit of work to go in there, but 
Um, we've had a couple of our developers that work for companies that um, do not allow the use of NGROC on their systems. Oh, Jamie, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's okay, I just, just raised it now. Um, I happen to be working in this space like right now, the, um, in the, the sort of the Redis area, like, cause I'm try trying to uh, set up a web socket and get rid of the, you know, polling um, feature. Um, so I, I would be kind of interested in okay up to date in this in this spot. Yeah. Yes. I think um, yeah, socket doc in in managing web sockets is going to make a huge difference. So definitely, um, if you're working there, let's let's get you involved in that. Thanks. Good. Um, Ngrok. Um, so we use Ngrok in a lot of issue in a lot of developer uh, demos and developer uh, setups, so that a a developer can have a local instance of Akapai um, and expose a public interface to it, uh, a public endpoint, so that other agents like wallets and things can talk to it. We use Ngrok for that. Um, one interesting side issue, if anyone knows of, uh, you know. Uh, people looking for a, a getting started project, this would be a good one, which is to actually use Akapai as a mediator client um, and to have uh, the mediator be the endpoint. So use the, for example, in DCO public um, mediator that is you know, a sandbox mediator that, that you can use, configure your Akapai agent to use it and, and then be able to, um, uh, uh, basically, be able to use that as as an as the endpoint for your Akapai agent. It would be public um, by default. All your messages would come in through the mediator, and you would not have to use Ngrok anymore. So, I, it is something that I kind of have a goal that we would um, eliminate the need for Ngrok for that purpose. So, keep that one in mind. Um, if um, as we go, from what I understand, Akapai is not. Uh, does not have the, I believe it's the pickup two algorithm, Daniel, if you could correct me on that, as a mediator client. So that would have to be updated as far as I know. Uh, that would be correct. Um, so as a, a, a quick kind of um, follow-up to the question of Ingraph and using Akapai as a mediator client. Um, so quite a while ago, actually, uh, we threw together a quick project um, that basically puts another mediator into the mix, which sounds complex, but it, it actually ended up being cleaner at, at that point in time, at least for us to implement it that way, as opposed to turning Akapai into a mediation client. So that, that mediator would sit alongside your Akapai instance within your, your firewall, within your network, whatever. Okay. Um, and that component would pull and receive messages from a mediator that is outside of uh, your firewall, so a, a public mediator, and then forward those messages onto the Akapai instance. Um, so it, it turned Akapai into being able to be capable of, of being a mediation client without needing to implement it directly within Akapai. Uh, and we've been using it for uh, quite a while uh, and it's been pretty reliable and, and useful for us. So that, that's an option. Uh, I still, I, I still think there's value in, in Akapai directly supporting that capability, but I think there's also the question of whether we want to add that complexity into Akapai and that whole question. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there's reasonable debate to be had there on, on what the best approach is. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure why you would need that because if, you know, if you've got an external mediator, all you've got to do, as far as I know, is, is configure a startup parameter so that Akapai uses that external mediator. Um, um, the issue that we ran into at the time was um, in order for Akapai to pull the WebSocket open to the external mediator or to pull for messages, there was going to be oh. a significant amount of work required in the inbound transport, uh, which, uh, yeah, again, at the time, we we determined it would be quicker for us to just Got have it. this okay. side thing that took care of that for us. Okay. Um yeah, I mean, I, I the the issue is more Ngrok and and Tim's raised that there's another Dio.io. The problem with any of these things is basically Ngrok or or equivalents creates a hole in the firewall, and companies don't like it when arbitrary holes can be punched into the firewall of their of their organization. 
Um, so that's why, you know, using a mediator basically just uses HTTP and eliminates the need for, for a WebSocket. So um, that would be the aim for that, or, or sorry, eliminates the need for punching the hole in the firewall. Um, I don't know if, 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 if how, um, how that affects things. So yeah. And agree, again, bring your own device. That is what most of us have been doing, but um, some people on our team are not able to do that. So there you go. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> um, let me check here. Where's the list? Um, Jason Syratuck, you are here. There yep. you are. Excellent. Um, progress on did peer two and three in Akabai. Do you mm -hmm. want to the screen? Yeah, I can. Uh, I don't need to share my screen now, but I'll, I can just provide a quick update. Um, yeah, so look at that. Uh, it's implementing the did peer two, two and three specs. I'm um, starting with just did peer two. Um, Sikpa Labs has a Python peer did library that um, was not around the first time Shanjal looked at this. So um, I've been looking to integrate with that, which has been a great um, resource to deal with some of the, the number crunching and the, the document construction itself. Um, so that's a good thing for the community to be aware of. Um, similarly, was some conflicts between what any did could be and a did peer um, spec. Uh, the 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 actual regexes defined by the specification were not compatible. Um, so after some discussion and some updates, um, the root of that issue is that did peer twos can have service entries, which are base64 encoded JSON. However, when you base64 encode, um, you may end up with some paddings, um, which is usually an equal sign. Well, equal sign is not a legal character <laughs> um, under the did spec. Um, so that was causing some confusion. Um, however, we resolved that and the, the uh, guidance and instructions going forward is that if you are base64 encoding something, you will need to strip equal signs off of that. Um, similar, another similar reason to do this, and we think that uh, Andrew Whitehead at some point brought up, is that if you have one did with an equal sign or one did without an equal sign, those are the same did. We shouldn't have two dids that um, look different but resolve the same things. Um, so for those two reasons, um, that's something to, to be aware of as well. Um, I don't know about any other did specs, but specifically did peer to um includes the service entry as base 64 encoded um so yeah um got uh and again and i'm looking to build in additional did resolvers um and uh understand uh, really this is my first time really cracking open Akapai um and understanding how connections are truly established so um i've been getting in there i've been creating did did did, did peer twos now um but now i've got to figure out how to how to leverage them in, into the payload and actually get um them to be the, the primary way that these connections are established. So still some progress to be done there, but um, that's kind of an update for the, the community about some things that have come to light um, and where we're going with um, Akapai's development. Any questions about that? Okay, there's an update, I'll pass it back to Steven. Okay, thanks, Ira. Um, good stuff, that's... Um... <clears throat> Super important as we get into now that 040 of AFJ is released. Um, that's now going 040 is going into bifold and therefore into various wallets. It is using um peer dids instead of unqualified dids for um uh didcom communication, didcom messaging. So super important to get that move forward. So that's good stuff. Um Okay, next was just an idea I've had this week that I wanted to share with others and see if um, anyone was interested in doing a quick quick and dirty project on this. Um, one of the most painful parts of using Occupy is the startup parameters. Um, there's so many um, for good and bad reasons. There's lots of them. Um, being able to understand what parameters are available, when you should use them, which ones you should use and making them easy to use, I think would be handled nicely um, rather than having the documentation we have today, which is basically, you know, 
spit out all of the options and then try to figure out which ones you need would be to have an actual um editor not not a yaml editor which you know there's lots of generic yaml editors but that doesn't really help with the domain issue we have of of how do you understand all the parameters and how they relate to one another and which ones you might or might not want to use in any one give in any one scenario so um I actually had done a project a while ago that used um, SurveyJS, so I was thinking that would be a way to do it. Um, for those not familiar with SurveyJS, um, it is basically a way, uh, a nice JSON and uh, user uh, and, and UI um, development tool for creating libraries. So you can have a library like this um, where you just add in questions so it's it's basically using it is a lot like using google forms you just add those in um when you edit those what you're really doing is um creating a json.js so you're basically just building up these elements so one could see that it would be really easy to take all of the you know 108 yaml parameters or or startup parameters that we have and simply, first of all, generate them into one of these and then go through one time to adjust them to um, have the help text for them, have the, your, your, sorry, generate all the help text into them, generate the right data types, group them, provide additional details. So I think we could have a one-time effort to go through in essentially using a Google Forms and creating something like this so we would half generate, half manually done. The manual part would be important because that's really providing the domain knowledge in there. Um, once we do that, that creates a nice package that, um, you know, the JSON.js that you saw there is, is an active component. So that would be part of the tool and then have a little bit of um, JavaScript code to initialize or load settings, um, a, a YAML file, um, put it into the format for the Java survey JS format uh, component so that uh, a user could use that survey JS component actively to edit their, um, their settings and then a process for um, taking it out of the survey JS format and into, um, into YAML to, to save it. So I think that would be relatively light. Um, and then to maintain the tool over time, basically uh, 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 a GitHub action that would monitor ch for changes in the startup parameters, basically maintain a file within the repo that takes the minus minus help output um, of the configuration data. Um, and then a, a GitHub action that runs a diff with that generates the latest output, diffs it with the file we have and creates an issue when the outputs differ. That issue would then trigger somebody to manually go in and adjust the components here um, of the editor. And so it would be, once the survey JS component or whatever we use um, gets created, it would be um, maintaining it over time, I think would be pretty simple. These things do not change significantly over time. So um, it would be a periodic, you know, as we do a release, um, adjust and add the, whatever parameters were necessary to it. So an idea there. Um, hoping I triggered some interest, I would be very glad to help out if somebody else I would do this part of it, and was interested enough to do this part of it. Um, I could definitely help out with the um, the the true documentation parts of this which is um actually generating a list and and making it a useful survey js component that we could maintain over time any thoughts comments does anyone know of other tools like this that would be better to use um and any experience in using these types of tools in the past All right, then. 
Um, I don't think um, we've only got a few PRs. Um, we really want to get 8-2 uh, done. Let me take a quick look at the PRs we have. Oops. That wasn't good and I probably shouldn't. Yeah, let me just go to there. Um, <clears throat> would like somebody to review the README and dev README updates that I've done, pretty trivial. Um, we've got the dev container. We're holding that till after um, the 8.2 release. Um, this is the big one that um, I'm wondering is uh, any, no progress has been made on this one. Um, we really need somebody to, um, that has a little bit of time to look at this one. Any comments on it? 3.6 support dropping it. I left this as a, as a comment already in, in the PR itself, but I, I did take some time to look through it, try it out a couple of things, still continuing to have the issue with the, of actions timing out. Um, so I don't really have much in the way of, of real updates or progress here, but uh, I was yeah. able to at least get some time to look at it. <clears throat> the this... Python period library that was written that I've been leveraging does not support 3.6. So that will, yeah. uh, those two are related, but again, I don't expect a, a conflict, but just that is something to me. This is a blocking change as far as I'm considering and, and probably the highest priority PR we have. Um, Do you want me to give a summary of sort of the testing that's been done so far? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, so basically what it is, is um, there's the BDD tests that get run, the integration tests that get run. And what ends up happening is there's one in particular that triggers it um, quite a bit. I've got links to all of the um, branches and everything that I've, that I've worked on as well as the, the runs. But basically what happens is um, an agent starts up, mediator starts up, and then the Bob agent starts up, and then it tries to start the Bob mediator, and it just never does. Like nothing happens, and it, uh, the process ends up timing out, and everything ends up uh, either locking up or failing. Um, I've tried exactly what um, Daniel did tried extending the timeouts that doesn't make a difference so extended it out to 10 minutes um so it, it's not a timing issue um what i did do is i tried different uh versions of python so uh, i tested in github actions and locally using 36 37 38 and 39 the issue starts happening in github actions at 38 um, where if I run it locally, it works fine all the way up to 3.9. So I can't reproduce it locally. So it's very difficult to um, debug. Um, I created a different branch that does nothing more than starts the mediator um, that can't start up with the parameters that are used by the test and it starts up just fine. So I don't under, I, I really don't understand why it's not starting up in, in the process of, of the tests. Um, funny thing is, even at using Python 3.9, some of the uh, integration tests work. So it seems to work when you have, you know, um, the one that runs before it is um, one, uh, one agent, one mediator, and a Bob agent communicating together. That one works fine. But as soon as you add that extra um, container, it seems to just not work. And I know. No idea why. Any thoughts from anyone on that? Could really use help on this one. Okay. Thanks, Wade. Thanks, Daniel. Um, this one is held up by the 361. Uh, period will be. Um, and then the rest, I think, are pretty much that we want to hold off until um, 8.2 goes out. The big one we're waiting on that we had been waiting on was this one. Um, updates on this one. 
Um, Sanshat, do you have an update? Uh, so uh, the implementation is done. So uh, the confusion I had yesterday with the uh, coordinating with Andrew uh, get, got past that. Implementation is basically the test uh, cases, unit test is what I'm working on right now uh, and should be pretty soon. Uh, I think uh, maybe before the uh, the, uh, the stand-up, uh, maybe I can push the changes. Um, is it worth pushing this into A2 or um, is this crucial to A2 or should we just put this as the, the first one, you know, assuming it's ready very, very soon, assuming it's ready today, do we want to just just because it is um, taken several iterations, um, it seems safer to put this into the next version. Um, is there objections from anyone on on saying that we're not going to include this one in 8.2 and we'll just put it in the next version? Comments? Uh, the only thing is the, uh, the changes are already in interaction that depends on uh, uh, this to be merged in. I think that's the only dependency I can see. And regarding the iteration, I think this would be the final because I don't see any more iterations after this. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's all we have for today. Any other topics anyone wants to um, raise today? All right, thanks for joining. Have a great Tuesday or whatever's left of it where you are. Thank you so much. Take care folks, bye.